It's probably more of a comment um, than a question, but in cases like the famous where we've got an incredibly high beta diversity, yes. um, would that kind of system work? Because, I mean, things like soil moisture become important, but right. you can't, I don't know if you can measure unless you know the extent of soil moisture across a landscape. What I would be looking at is much finer resolution remotely sensed data, which is to say, you know, my work typically is in climatic dimensions, or that last example, and I think the previous one, were using MODIS or NDVI data, sorry, MODIS or AVHRR data in terms of multi-temporal NDVI. Um, and so we had a spatial resolution of a quarter to a half a kilometer. Mm. Um, but if we were talking about kind of from here to the Cape of the Good Hope, um, I would be looking for satellite imagery. At the coarsest, I'd be using Landsat data. And then there are some much better data sets out there. Um, Hyperion is a, is a hyperspectral sensor that just gives you, it's essentially too much information, but it's really spectacular. Um, and then I've been playing with LIDAR imagery, which characterizes vegetation structure. But regardless, I'd, I'd find the friend who's a, a, uh, who's a whiz with remote sensing. <laughs> and I would develop the characterization of this region at a very fine scale. And then I would throw out, you must have maps of, of the limits of primary vegetation. Mm. Throw out everything that's you know this and the city and things like that, or wineries. <laughs> And so you're left with just this very spotty map of where you have remnants. remnants. Yeah. And OK, so then you have beta diversity. And that can be for two reasons. It can, because, it can be because the environment is very choppy. Or it can be because of, of barriers. OK, it might have the same environments, but a barrier. And so you get turnover either because of speciation or turnover more locally. Or you may just have a very irregular environment. They kind of are the same thing. Um, but it would be very interesting, essentially, to take your known occurrence of a species and essentially see, OK, if I go you know, within a kilometer, Maybe I am finding populations. What about within 10 kilometers or within 50? Essentially, what are the limits of that signal? And that's going to speak to how chopped up the environment is from the perspective of that species dispersal. But again, these are local only. Yes. Okay? They're not going to get us the full potential distribution of the species. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, this is very interesting because I tried it. I don't know how it even came to me. I tried it with fruit flies, whereby oh, you can't sample the whole country, but I sampled a few sites, especially for the ones that uh, you cannot detect easily. Because the way we work with fruit flies that we use lures, and some of the lures are not very easy to get. So if you can be lucky to detect in a few sites, then you can now predict. Mm -hmm. But now the challenge comes uh, from uh, determining which is more important. Is it the temperature and all these environment parameters or the interaction with the plant species? Because then the argument when you present these results is, okay, temperature is available here, but what is going to determine might not be the temperature, might be the plants that actually... But, so without that's a doubt. the challenge I got with this kind of data. Well, See, now we're getting into kind of more distributional ecology questions. But my approach to that would be to look for the same environments with and without those plants. And essentially erect statistical comparisons to ask whether the species occurrence is more probable where that plant occurs versus where it doesn't. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So, Imagine we, we outline the species requirements in terms of climate, and we get some broad area. And we have occurrences within that broad area. Okay? But obviously, the occurrences are not across the whole broad area. So you could ask, 
whether those occurrences occur in the part of the suitable area with respect to climate that holds those plants. Which is to say, do the plants further reduce the potential distribution or not? Okay? And if you find those known occurrences clustering in areas, only in areas where that plant is present, then you have a very nice bit of evidence that it is not just climate, but climate and this biotic interaction. Okay. And we've seen that, for example, uh, Jorge Soberon has been working with some, some butterflies in, um, in Mexico that are tightly allied to certain trees. And it's exactly what I just described. In terms of climate, you get this broad potential distribution. But the occurrence of the butterflies is a little spotty within that broad potential. If you overlay the distribution of the plants, it explains it all. The species can only be where the climate is right and where the plant is present. Okay. Yeah, because uh, the other approach, I think, is similar to what you just said. It was suggested that, okay, you can model for the species on the basis of maybe temperature and all these factors. And then you also look at the factors for the plant. Mm -hmm. You also model that, then you subtract areas that would not be suitable, I think is what you just said, for the plants, but actually for the temperature and the others, it would be suitable. Exactly. For those who don't, they be. Yeah. And essentially, you want to be comparing those two sets of areas. Yes. Suitable abiotically, no plant present, versus suitable abiotically, plant present. And you want to ask whether that has explan explanatory power as to where the where the, the flies are, okay? Okay, because you answered part of it in that, then N should be very small. That means you're stressing more on the observance, not the abundance. Remember, I don't believe in abundance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> True, but then when N is small, how, how representative would, would that be for, for a particular region? As opposed to data on abundance. I, I shouldn't be so absolute about abundance. There are situations where abundances are measured quantitatively and fairly objectively. If you had then a site with 100 individuals as compared to a site with one individual, and if those abundances could be believed to be meaningful, then you might want to prioritize similarity to the high abundance site over similarity to the low abundance site. Too frequently, and definitely in these examples that I'm giving you, the abundance data don't even exist. You know, you just know, up oh, there's the type locality, or, um, you know, we know of one remaining population, but it may be small because of land use, or harvesting, or grazing, or whatever. So again, I, I tend to avoid data or data types that will frequently be falsely precise. But maybe, maybe I, I shouldn't emphasize that so much. Okay, because of the potential chance of an outlier, the, the, the single species that probably you spot is, is out of its home range. Well, I mean, certainly if we were talking about, you know, some, some species with large populations, you'll get kind of a core of the distribution and then sites that are visited occasionally. I think when we're talking about species like this, there is no grand mass of individuals. And so I would think it would be very rare to see true outliers. But those are, those are assumptions. You know, essentially, Nobody in the niche modeling world has really found a way of dealing w effectively with common sink populations. We're basically always assuming that sink populations are rare. So a real outlier or vagrant, the models don't have any really good way of dealing with that. Okay. Okay, so do we all agree that's enough of niche modeling or one last question? Just being curious. In the specific example of the T. Shalocki uh -huh. example, I'm 
wondering what the similarity was between the type locality and the other site in the village. It was, they were fairly similar. Um, it was a little, um, it's a little strange because if you go to the two sites, they look to the human eye fairly different, okay. which is to say the type locality, you saw that, it was a pile of rocks. Yeah. And the human habitation is some huts in the middle of a flat. Mm -hmm. And so we see them as quite different environments. Yeah. But for two reasons, it may, they may not be so different. One is that the bugs may just be looking for shelter, you know, crevices and cracks. Mm -hmm. And those houses are great, and the rocks are great. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in that sense, the microenvironments they present may be fairly unique on those landscapes and, and fairly similar, okay. right? I want a place where I'm not baking in the sun, where I can get into a crevice, hide out, maybe a place where there are animals, well, in the rocks and in the huts, okay? Uh, the other thing is, if I remember right, the environmental data we used in that study were at one kilometer resolution. Okay. So there's a fair amount of spatial averaging. You're not talking about microenvironments, you're talking about something that's bigger than that. And so what those environmental data should pick up on is seasonal dynamics, okay? Because we were feeding in probably 12 months of the year. And so, you know, a tropical rainforest would be green, 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 high values of these vegetation indexes. What vegetation is in that landscape would be green for a short period when it rains, and then brown. And a lot of that landscape has very little vegetation, and so it would just be brown. And so what you're seeing when you look at, when you see that map of similarity and dissimilarity, it's probably those seasonal profiles. Mm -hmm.